Hey everyone, it's Mark here. In this video, I'm going to talk about Warren Buffett's recent rejection of diversity and sustainability reporting. In effect, it appears that he has ascribed to the mantra that go woke, go broke. I'm going to talk about his decision, why he made the decision, and why I think ultimately his decision is correct here. And I'm going to try to keep this as measured as possible in my discussion of it. Now, I have a background in finance. I have a PhD in finance. I'm an angel investor, and I'm a quant. Now, my PhD particularly focused on corporate governance, and I have published peer-reviewed research on CEOs, CEOs' behavioral characteristics, CEO compensation, and how to maximize shareholder wealth. These have appeared in top-tier journals. So I know directly what I am talking about when I am talking about corporate governance. This is particularly within my area of expertise. So hence why I was particularly interested in this when I saw Warren Buffett's decision. Nevertheless, I have no monopoly on ideas. So if you think I've missed anything, if you think I'm wrong, if there's anything else you'd like to say, drop those in the comments below or drop those thoughts in the comments below. And obviously it would be great if you liked the video and subscribe to the channel. Okay, so what exactly has happened here? Well, Warren Buffett has rejected diversity and sustainability reporting. It appears at a general meeting or about 24% of shareholders had wanted to pursue this type of thing. Obviously, 76% of the voting shares, or voting rights rather, had rejected it. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this. To see this, I'm going to go to a New York Times article and go through what exactly they're saying. So here we have a New York Times article. Now, I'm going to be upfront here and say that I think the New York Times is trash. I think it's biased. I think it's clearly a socialist publication, although I'm clearly a capitalist. So obviously, we'd have arguments either way. I personally prefer to get my news from the Wall Street Journal. But because the New York Times is clearly the most uh, unaligned with myself, it seems best to refer to New York Times so that you have both perspectives here, rather than just hearing from Wall Street Journal, which is clearly going to agree with me more. So here in the deal book section of, uh, of New York Times, it said, Buffett fights with shareholders with his reputation at risk. Rather a scare headline here, I think. But in any case, they're trying to say, Warren Buffett's reputation might be risked by this. I disagree with that because as a capitalist, I care about him maximizing shareholder wealth. That's pretty much it. And his reputation rests on him going out and making money. That's it. But anyway, it says here, the Berkshire chief opposed shareholder proposals on climate and diversity. Notably, these were by a minority of voting rights, but that's another issue. So we scroll down a little bit more. It says, Berkshire bucks the trend. Tomorrow, Berkshire Hathaway's annual general shareholder meeting gathering known as the Woodstock for Capitalists late like last year. I butchered that sentence. It says, tomorrow is Berkshire Hathaway's annual shareholder meeting. The gathering known as Woodstock for Capitalists. Like last year, the company is bow bowing to the times by holding the meeting virtually. But another aspect of the discussion may show that Warren Buffett is increasingly out of step with the times. Now, that is going to be wrong, as we will see. Investors are pressing, Ber pressing Berkshire to disclose more about climate change and workforce diversity. Shareholders, including CalPERS, argue that Buffett's conglomerate isn't doing enough to disclose its portfolio company's progress in addressing those issues. Buffett is opposed to these initiatives ahead of the meeting, arguing that they cut against Berkshire's philosophy of letting its subsidiaries operate largely independently. I don't believe in imposing my personal opinions on the activities of our businesses, he said at a 2018 annual meeting. Buffett is expected to get his way for now. He controls over a third of Berkshire's voting power and holds sway over faithful retail investors, virtually guaranteeing the proposals will fail. The biggest question is whether this will tarnish Berkshire's golden reputation. So that's effectively what it said. So what can we see from this? Well, what we can see from this is that Warren Buffett has shot down this reporting. He shot it down largely for portfolio management reasons. He's argued that he doesn't get involved in the personal management of these companies. B, he doesn't like to impose political issues on these companies. And C, it isn't really his job. His job is to go out and find good companies to make money. That's effectively why he shot these down. I agree with Warren Buffett wholeheartedly. And I'm going to go through several reasons for why this is the case. Firstly, he's a portfolio manager. His job is to go out and maximize value. 
In his case, that translates into maximizing the value of Berkshire Hathaway shares. But his job is to maximize that share price. His job is not to go out and achieve politically correct ends. His job is not to do what Cowper's wants. His job is not to do what progressives at New York Times want. His job is to be the CEO of a company and to make money. And his responsibility, his duty as a director is literally to do this. If he were to ignore those responsibilities, he would violate his director's duty. His duty is to maximize shareholder wealth. That is it. And therefore, these other reporting metrics are tangential to his overarching responsibility. Secondly, only 24% of shareholders supported the proposal. Only 24% of the voting rights, sorry. That means 76% of all votes rejected it. A majority of the votes rejected it. If one were to take New York Times' proposal to its illogical conclusion, we end up with a tyranny of the minority. We end up with 24% of shareholders dictating to 76% of shareholders what they do. That is so incredibly stupid. It is so incredibly undemocratic that 24% of the voting rights can dictate to 76% of the voting rights what they do. The New York Times obviously does not care about democracy if that's the type of proposal it is really pursuing. New York Times has such a large amount of hypocrisy in this that it is beyond belief. The New York Times was precisely the type of organization that would routinely talk about, say, Donald Trump's voting numbers, talk about him being a minority elected president because he didn't get 50% of the number of Americans he won by the Electoral College. But then in the same breath, will turn around and support a proposal from 24% of shareholders. So incredibly hypocritical that the publication could actually support those two different proposals. It is beyond belief that they can do that with a straight face. Thirdly, the proposals are tangential to shareholder wealth. These diversity metrics have not been shown to in any way increase shareholder wealth. Shareholders should go out and hire the best person for the job. That person might be male, they might be female, they might be non-binary, they might be whatever. It doesn't really matter. What it matters is their qualifications and whether they can maximize value. This is the same mutatis mutandis at the race-related level. The racial background of a person should not be what dictates whether you hire them. Rather, their merits for the job should be what dictates it. One should not be racist in one's hiring and one should not be racist in one's reporting, i.e. one should go out and maximize value by hiring the best person for the job. That's what these shareholders should be focusing on. They should be focusing on making sure that Berkshire Hathaway tries to get its companies to hire the best people, not achieving an arbitrary threshold when they deem it to be politically correct enough. Rather, it should be based on ensuring there is no racism. That is what should be achieved an elimination of racism, not the replacement of one type of racism with a different type of racism. That is effectively what Cowper's could propose if we take it to its illogical conclusion here. Basically, what we're seeing here is the type of thing that is not going to maximize wealth. Now, if we dig deep into the literature in relation to this, Jesse Fried of Harvard has created a rather extended and thorough literature review in this area. Jesse Fried's literature review explicitly says that there is no support for these diversity metrics in any way in relation to shareholder wealth maximization. He's asserted that these things are tangential to shareholder wealth maximization, and that these diversity quotas and metrics should not necessarily be the be all and end all. Specifically, there is no particular reason for these things to be promoted or for this to be mandated. So let's have a look at exactly what he is saying here. So we can see this directly by looking at his working paper here, which is available for free on SSRN. In the abstract, and one can download the whole thing, he says, in December 2020, NASDAQ and the SEC, uh, NASDAQ asked the SEC, sorry, to approve new diversity rules. The aim is for most NASDAQ listed firms to have at least one director self-identifying as female, and another self-identifying as an underrepresented minority or LGBTQ+. Well, NASDAQ claims these rules will benefit investors. 
the empirical evidence provides little support for the claim that gender or ethnic diversity in the boardroom increases shareholder value. In fact, rigorous scholarship, much of it by leading female economists, argues that increasing board diversity can actually lead to lower share prices. Adoption of NASDAQ's proposed rules would thus generate substantial risks for investors. This is a fellow from Harvard Law School who has reviewed the literature. In essence, he's basically saying here that mandating these types of requirements, these diversity requirements, can harm shareholders. Therefore, Warren Buffett is perfectly in line with quite a large amount of literature here. Warren Buffett would appear to be, in fact, in this case, on the correct side of the literature. It would appear that by rejecting this type of reporting, Warren Buffett is entirely consistent with what the academic literature is showing in this respect. And this is academic literature from someone who is incredibly respected within the field and is at Harvard Law School. So I would dare say that Warren Buffett is actually on the right side of history here if one looks at some of this evidence. Now, oftentimes, people will anecdotally cherry pick reports, and these reports are often rather problematic and incorrect. So one example of this is the WEGA report. So this WEGA report basically purported to say that more women at the top proves better for business. It says female top managers add 6.6% to the market value of ASX, that's Australian Stock Exchange, listed companies. Female leadership will help businesses thrive in a post-COVID world. That's what their headline says. People often cherry pick these types of articles to try to argue for the goal of having diversity mandates. The problem is this headline completely misrepresents the results. In another video, I've talked about why this study is incredibly badly executed. It has omitted variables everywhere. It doesn't deal with causality. It is a shambles. It would not pass as a thesis at university, let alone pass peer review. But that notwithstanding, we can dig deeper into this report and see precisely what results they have omitted to say. So here I've opened up the report, the PDF of this report. Now in the PDF of the report, we can scroll down to their tables. Now their tables are interesting, in part because the headline grabbing uh, numbers or the headlines that they have don't necessarily match up with the tables. So here we have one of their regression tables. What they're effectively looking at is what factors are associated with improvement in wealth and profitability of the company or outperformance. So if we scroll in a little bit, we can see, we, if we can see here, what we'll see down here is share of the female board members, i.e. how many uh, members of the board are female. And what we'll see here is there's some statistically insignificant results, which basically tells us there's some insignificance here. Furthermore, we've got gender composition of the workforce. Now, if we look at gender composition of the workforce, we see some super mixed results down here. So for example, let's look at share of female uh, workers. For some of these columns, it's positively associated with Tobin's Q. For others, it is negatively associated with our performance. What this tells us is we're getting mixed results and nothing is necessarily hard and fast in relation to diversity being good, bad, or otherwise. What this tells us is you need to focus on the person as a person. Don't just focus on one individual trait, their gender or whatever. Focus on their personal qualifications. One should avoid racism and sexism rather than focusing on their gender identity as the be all and end all of your diversity metrics. So Warren Buffett is in fact correctly related to the literature here. He has seemingly noted that the literature has said that diversity is not necessarily going to maximize shareholder wealth, rather you need to look at the individual characteristics of the person as a person. And therefore he would appear to be on the correct side of the academic findings. So what does this mean wrapping it all up? Well, wrapping it all up, I would agree with Warren Buffett here. Warren Buffett has rejected diversity and sustainability reporting. He's rejected this seemingly because he doesn't want to get involved in these companies, but also because he has quite possibly correctly noted that we should be talking about individuals as separate people. We should look at their traits, their individual traits, their education, their experience, their expertise, not just their identity, not just whether they're male or female or whatever other gender we might ascribe to them, not just their racial background. Rather, we should be looking at the individual characteristics. So he is correct to reject those diversity requirements. 
Now, if we look specifically at sustainability here, again, is correct to reject that as well, because sustainability can affect shareholder wealth. But one has to do this carefully. Climate change is real, and climate change is something that we need to be concerned about. However, many of the companies that contribute to climate change, coal miners, for example, or power plants, are going to suffer reducing growth. This is going to reduce their earnings and reduce their attractiveness as a company. As a result, he would potentially avoid them for purely financial reasons. Furthermore, he should not be the one who is going out and making policy decisions here. Rather, he should be concerned about what is going to maximize the value of Berkshire Hathaway, rather than what other people, 24% of the votes, are telling him what to invest in. So overall, I would agree with Warren Buffett here, 24% of shareholders seemingly disagree, or 24% of the voting rights disagree. Clearly, he should not be beholden to 24% of the votes, because that is obviously undemocratic. And I would agree with Warren Buffett's stance here, because it appears to be on the correct side of the literature. In any case, those are my views on Warren Buffett here. If you think I've missed anything, or if you have a different view, let me know that in the comments below. Otherwise, of course, it would be great if you like the video and subscribe to the channel. And I very much hope to see you for future videos as well. Bye.